Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Documentary Life. This is a podcast that sets out to inspire and educate each and every one of us on what it means as well as how to best lead a documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. As always, I am honored and thankful that you've tuned me in as opposed to tuned me out. I don't take that lightly. There are a zillion podcasts out there one can listen to. The fact that you've chosen to listen to mine in this moment, well, it truly means a lot and it most definitely fuels my fire. I feel like it's been ages since I've been on the show, which in a way I suppose it has. My family and I went back to the Buffalo and Rochester, New York area, where I'm originally from, to suss out some potential Barong Films clients and to spend time with the extended family. Before leaving town, I made sure to pre record a couple of shows to run while I was away. So, yeah, it does feel like I've been away from you guys for a spell. That being said, I did manage to record a special show with my brother Brian over the vacation. It's meant to be a maybe a one-off episode, maybe as an additional show for a week, you know, or a behind-the-scenes DVD extra, if you will, it being a bit unique in nature. Basically, my brother wanted to interview yours truly in order to delve into some things maybe a little bit more personal in tone, so we decided to just kind of wing it. Apparently, my brother, a dedicated listener of the program, felt that while he was sure everyone was very much appreciative of my bi-weekly how to documentary wisdom that they'd also benefit greatly from maybe hearing a little bit more about who I am and what motivates me to do the things that I do. Yeah, <laughs> I've not even edited the program yet, but let's just say that the tables were definitely turned on this old TDL host. Anyhow, I'm not sure how or when or where that will air, but at some point it will. And of course, I'll let you know as soon as it does. Today marks a couple of mini milestones for the show. Number one, it happens to be episode number 10. That's right, baby, we're into double digits. And number two, we just this past week passed the 700 downloads mark. While those may not seem like huge numbers, it does say a couple of things that are worth noting. It says that I'm committed to this show. Since day one, without fail, I've brought you the Documentary Life bi-weekly on Fridays. I've made sure to bring you the two shows per month divided between one show entirely hosted by myself and the other show being a conversation with a documentary-related industry person. But you know, it's not just about being committed to coming up with the topic, recording the show, then editing the show. Sure, the commitment is integral to its success, but I also happen to love doing this show. Of course, I was super excited about this idea I'd come up with for a podcast a few months back, but one can never really know how they're going to feel once they've been doing it for a while. You know, kind of like when you first set out to do your documentary film. You're super jazzed about your idea, about, you know, putting the crew, to, crew together, the first couple of shoots. But, you know, is your, is your excitement and enthusiasm going to be sustained the next one to five years that you might need to see the film through? Well, it's safe to say that not only has my excitement been sustained through the first 10 episodes, but my passion, my hopes for the show, it's increased exponentially. And you know, you have a lot to do with that. Your commitment to this show has made a huge difference in my life. I literally get up in the morning and one of the first things I think about, and I'm being totally genuine here, I wonder how many people have enjoyed or been inspired in any way by one of the shows. And you know that I have a lot going on. You know, two kids under the age of two and a half. 
freelance jobs, Barong Films jobs, our Elvis of Cambodia doc. So, so for this podcast to be one of the first things I think about every day, well, you get my drift. I love this show. I love doing it. I love talking to the guests. I love reading your emails and meeting people from all over the world. Love hearing and sharing your documentary stories. So 700 downloads, while not huge per se, for me it says a lot and it drives me to do more. It says that people are listening to this little show about making documentaries and living a documentary life. It proves out what I've suspected, you know, since I first came up with the idea for the show, that there is a need here to be filled and that we're filling it. That we have documentary filmmakers out there who appreciate the message of this show, who want to be inspired, who want to be educated, who want to be learning from others, who want to be forming a community of like-minded individuals. If I sound like I'm excited about all this, I am. And I have you to thank for that. And really, we all have one another to thank for that. I, the, maybe the only slight bummer to all of this is that I have no idea who most of you are. Yes, sure, I have this number of 700 plus downloads, right? And, and, and I know that I have a number of subscribers. But other than some colleagues and, and some listeners who, I, who, who have emailed me, I really don't yet know who you, my listeners, are. So I'd love to take a moment to ask you, if you could, please introduce yourself by emailing me or subscribing to the Documentary Life newsletter. My email is chris at barongfilms.com. It's chris at b-a-r-a-n-g films.com. And the website for the show is www.thedocumentarylife.com. I don't know if I really need to be saying www's anymore, but nonetheless, there it is. Please, please, please drop me a line and let me know who you are and why you listen to the show. So speaking of emails, that last part about building this community of documentary lifers brings me to an email that I received just this past week. As you know, if I can, I like to open up shows with an email or two from a listener. It might be some feedback for the show, maybe comments about a prior guest. It might be some advice that the listener might like to share, or it might be someone looking for a little advice themselves. This particular email well, it comes from a Jonathan who I think is based out of Las Vegas. I, I could be wrong, but there was a couple of mentions in Ve there were a couple of mentions of Vegas within some of the correspondence that we've shared, which by the way is pretty cool that we've been able to have a bit of back and forth email correspondence. As I've said often on this show, I will always respond to your emails. I may not be able to always continue emailing back and forth for any length of time or may miss a couple here and there if we've been emailing for a bit, but I can promise you that if you have written me for the first time, you will definitely, absolutely, I promise you 100% hear back from me. Anyhow, Jonathan works as a shooter in the TV news industry. He's got an idea for a documentary series that he'd like to produce with some friends and colleagues. His, his emails have been great. He was very complimentary of the documentary life, offered some suggestions on, on more of what he might like to hear in the future. He shared some of his own doc project with me, and, and then he had a number of questions that he was hoping I might be able to, to help him out with. But I'll share his first email with you, and I'll, I'll just read this directly. It reads, Hello, Chris. First off, love the podcast. Can't get enough. Please keep it up. Secondly, I really don't understand funding. How can I, someone with no documentary but some slight TV experience, get a group of people to fund what I want to shoot? Is there a group of like-minded people online I could find to ask similar questions? Thank you, Jonathan. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for your email and for the follow-ups we've had over the past week. The first thing that I'd like to say is that I'm not sure why you say that you're someone with no documentary experience. If you are working in TV news, particularly as a shooter, you're working with people's stories every day. In some ways, it's how I myself you know, started back in 1997, not that I want to date myself or anything, when I was shooting and editing for a local TV news network in Vancouver, Washington, which now doesn't even exist, by the way. Sure, the stories that we were covering, they didn't really hold my interest an awful lot. You know, old lady lost her cat up in a tree, the fire department gets called in to take Kitty down, or worse you know, worse yet, going to the, the county courthouse and waiting an hour to shoot for 30 seconds, some small-time hoodlum entering the courthouse. But, but the fact of the matter is, I was still telling stories. 
I was starting to work on my storytelling craft. By shooting interviews and B-roll, by interacting with people in the community, by you know going back to the newsroom, cutting the story together, I was each and every day, slowly but surely, maybe painfully, developing my skills as a storyteller. If that's not what a documentary filmmaker does, well, then I shouldn't be talking to you on this show. Now, I realize you were probably saying that you hadn't worked on specifically a full-on documentary film project that you, know, that you were working in TV news, but still, I hope that you can see my point here. You're a storyteller. You're practicing that art maybe on a daily basis. So I'd argue that you know, you're already doing documentaries, that it's not true that you have no doc experience. Now, in terms of answering your question about funding, that's obviously a much longer discussion than just the email segment of the show. I mean, we could talk about funding for 10 episodes and still have much to cover. Heck, you know, we've already had one show that dealt with funding on a grassroots level when I talked with filmmaker Lydia B. Smith, and you can listen to that show by going back and checking out, I think it's episode number five. In it, Lydia talks about getting right with your approach to money. She referenced uh, the Lynn Twist book called The Soul of Money. Lydia also talked at great length about the you know the importance of building a grassroots campaign maybe well before your film has even you know begun shooting we heard how that early on the building of a community for her film helped her not only with putting together fundraisers uh, a very successful crowdfunding run but it, but how it also set herself up for things like film tours around the country once the film was finished in future episodes we'll be dealing with the idea of funding quite a bit Everything from grant writing to crowdfunding campaigns, you know, to the idea of self-financing. The question of funding is one of, if not the most asked question that I seem to ever come across in the documentary community. And rightfully so. As if making a documentary film wasn't difficult enough already, without any kind of budget, at least some money, I don't want to say it's impossible. But yeah, let's just, you know, state the obvious right here. That has made a hell of a lot more difficult. For now, Jonathan, take some comfort in knowing that you're already a step ahead of the game. You already have some video production experience, and from the sound of your email, you're surrounded by others who are doing the same. That alone is going to say something to someone who might want to contribute to your cause. So thank you again for the email, Jonathan, and feel free to keep writing me. I really appreciate that. Also, for anyone else out there like Jonathan who might have some suggestions for the show or a question or two they might like to share with the community, Again, you can write me directly at chris at barongfilms.com. And you can also, you know, get to me through the website, thedocumentarylife.com, and write for me, you know, write me from there. This is a great way to build the TDL community, and it's a great way for me to better understand what your needs and desires are for this show moving forward. Okay, now what I'd like to spend the rest of the show talking about also just happens to be inspired a bit by our friend Jonathan's email. It's this idea of what might be helpful to know or to avoid before jumping in to that first film, before jumping into your doc. What are the things that we filmmakers wished we'd known when we were first starting out on our doc project? I love this topic because I feel that it's so in line with what the show is about. Building a network of like-minded individuals in order to help one another be the best documentary filmmakers that we can be. And a big part of that is learning from one another's experiences and avoiding the pitfalls that other filmmakers before us have made. So what I'd like to do is offer up a list of things that you might do as a filmmaker before jumping in. And believe me, much of what I'm about to tell you, I wish that I had known myself long before doing Journey to Kathmandu. So number one, before jumping into your first documentary project or, or any documentary project, whether it's your first or not, surround yourself with the right key players for your project and hopefully from the get-go. When I started out on Journey to Kathmandu, I needed a producer. So I brought in someone who was a first-time producer. She'd worked in advertising on the client side of things, had been on plenty of commercial sets, but she hadn't ever actually worked on a production herself, and certainly not as a producer. However, she was super energetic, super excited about the project, and looking forward to working on her first film. And I figured that energy alone would go a long way, and that I could show her whatever she might need to know as as we went on. That didn't end up turning out so well. Like I said... Super energetic, and she worked her butt off. Great things, no doubt. But asking someone who's never worked on a production to produce a documentary film, well, that's too much for anyone. 
Not only that, but she never really had any sort of attachment to the subject matter of the film, an annual trek that goats make in Nepal to, to their sacrificial deaths, or the country, Nepal, that we were to be filming in. This was my passion project, not hers. What, what did she know or care about goats in Nepal? And, and why should she? Through no fault of her own, she wasn't equipped to produce Journey to Kathmandu. I had set her up for failure, and it set me back a while since I had to postpone filming for a whole calendar year. So make sure to get the right people on board with your project, and and hopefully you can do this early on. There's going to be missteps along the way, and there will be times that maybe as you go along, you find out, you know, maybe people aren't right for the project. That's only natural. But if there's any way in the key positions, say your DP or your producer or your or your director, though, I, I'm, you know, I would assume you're directing your own film project. Um, if, if you can make sure to really do your diligence, your, your due diligence beforehand. Again, you can never really know until you're working with this person, but hopefully you're going to bring in the right person from the get go. You know, make sure they're either at least good at their particular craft or that they at least feel as strongly about the subject matter itself as you do. Which leads me to my next suggestion before jumping into your first documentary project. Your subject matter, it must hold your interest for at least, I don't know, the next three years, preferably five. You've, it's, it has to be able to sustain. Nothing stops your project faster than if you lose interest in your subject. That may sound kind of funny now, and that may sound, you know, that may sound like that's not that's not possible because you're really excited about your idea. We all are at first, right? We have an idea, we start to run with it in our heads, we start to assemble different ideas branched off of that. We start to think of the people that could be involved. We start to think about the people that we could interview. Um, I get that, right? I get that. It's a, but here's the thing. A documentary film, it's it's a huge life commitment. So make sure it's something that you, you're sure you can be passionate about for the duration of production, post-production, and then through distribution. This is a long time that you're going to be working on this idea. How can you maybe help yourself be sure that you can sustain interest through the duration of filming and then post and then and then distribution afterwards? Maybe visualize what you'll be doing in life for the next five years. Will the film and its content fit into that? Is the subject matter something you've long already been passionate about? Do you tend to be passionate about things for a while or do you jump from one new thing to the next? Keep these things in mind Um, as best you can. You've got to find out before you really delve into this. Is the subject matter for sure going to hold your interest for an extended period of time? Okay, moving on to number three. Is there an audience for your film? Are there others out there who are as passionate about the subject matter as you are? If not, then you might end up putting all your time and energy into a vanity project that ends up as a DVD sitting in your bookshelf for the rest of your life, you know, seen by none other than you and and the people that you interviewed for the film. If there are others, even if it's a niche audience, like my friend and colleague Bird McDonald, whose last film called Vintage Tomorrow's It was about steampunk and future casting technologies. Yeah, not a film with a seemingly huge audience, right? However, it had a very specific and niche audience and therefore was attractive to a certain community. You can have success not only with getting an audience, but getting funding, good interviewees, and building the aforementioned all-important grassroots community. I cannot stress the importance enough of, 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 of finding out and doing your, again, again, doing that due diligence, doing your research beforehand if there is an audience for your film. You want to be able to know as you move forward in filming and, and as you start to put the film together that, that you have people that will, that will want to see this film. I mean, film is not like a number of other artistic ventures it's not something that it's not like maybe painting where there can be this very zen sort of experience that you have while 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 practicing this craft while drawing or or while painting and you don't necessarily have to have an audience for this i have good friends who are painters and nobody sees their paintings and they couldn't be happier for it because it for them it's more about the process right that's what that's what fulfills them filmmaking i would argue is entirely different there are so many processes to filmmaking and so much time and effort that goes into it you can't do a film and you can't sit down one evening like you can painting a picture 
You can't do that with film. It's going to take an ex- extreme amount of t- time and energy, other people's energy. And so therefore, you, I can only imagine that you want to have some sort of audience for your film. Number four, post-production budget. Now, that may seem like we're getting ahead of ourselves. And the whole idea was, you know, hey, we're creating a list about the things that you might want to know or be wary of before jumping into your doc project. Well, yes, post-production comes much later, but you need to be thinking of this long before you start doing your, your doc project. I realize this might seem like a luxury, right? But please, please take it from me who I've had to learn this not once, but twice on projects, you have to make sure to build some kind of budget for post-production. I cannot tell you how many films have failed because all of the energy and excitement and fundraising, it was used up in pre and then actual production. So then, you know, when it came time for post-production, there was nothing left. You know, people had nothing left energetically or financially to actually edit the film. They'd spent all of their time developing and fundraising and and filming for. I realize it's easier said than done, but just do it. Plan for your post. You don't want to end up like a very high percentage, by the way, of filmmakers who end up, you know, wrapping principal photography and then, you know, naturally feeling a sense of relief and completion, right? You almost have a feeling that, that you've finished the film. But the reality is you've barely begun. You've actually just completed the easy part. The hard part still remains in front of you. You're going to need a lot more energy. You're going to need a lot more funding. And so as best you can, be planning for that before you even shoot your first frame. And finally, I'm going to throw this in. And and maybe this is something that it may not fit exactly with this list of before jumping in, but it's something that I really want you to consider. And that's this idea of, you know, when you go into production, record good audio, right? You need to record the best audio that you can record. I'm telling you right now, nothing, nothing will sync your film quicker than if you have bad sound. People assume wrongly, I might add, that if they have the latest, greatest technology, you know, they have the 8K camera for red and someone who knows how to operate it well, and and they have a very good story, that their film is bound for huge success. However, if you have crappy audio that you recorded with some handheld microphone, or you use the mic on the front of your DSLR camera, or, you know, you have this, that incessant buzz throughout the majority of your most important interview for your film, forget about it. There is no amount of audio wizardry that's going to help that. And and there is nothing that will turn off an audience faster than your audio. Try, try a little something for me. The next time you watch a film, close your eyes and watch the film. And I'm saying watch it with your mind and your brain. Your eyes are closed. You're hearing it. And that's how you're watching it. It's amazing how you can follow the story of a film even if you can't see the picture. Right? Now, imagine that audio compromised and your eyes closed. Totally different situation. So you have to be aware that an audience is much more forgiving of shaky cam or drop frames than they are of shoddy audio. It's not always what you see. It's all about the ears, I'm telling you. So do not, under any circumstance, go cheap on your audio. You will seriously regret it. All right, so to go back and and list these out again one more time, here are sort of my ideas, the best things that you can do um, before jumping into doing your doc project. Number one, your subject matter must hold your interest for an extended period of time, maybe at least the next three years, preferably five. Two, is there truly an audience for your film? Three, you need to have a post-production budget. And four, Make sure you're recording good audio or you're set up to record good audio, you know, when you do go into filming. Well, that's our show for today. As always, I hope that some of this served as education and inspiration for your own documentary filmmaking endeavors. Before I go, I want to share some of the upcoming guests that will be on this show in the next coming months. 
I'm honored and excited to announce that Faith Fuller of Desktop Documentaries will be on the show. That's desktopdocumentaries.com. She'll be talking about the new Desktop Documentaries platform as well as some of the multitude of documentary filmmaking courses and materials that she offers on the site. We'll also be having a conversation with documentary filmmaker Crofton Dyack. Crofton's an old friend of mine who happens to be one hell of a documentary shooter, having shot the Sundance Award winner here and now, back in maybe 2007, as well as she's been a shooter and producer on a host of reality TV shows, including the History Channel's Axemen, Nat Geo's Life Below Zero, and Animal Planet's Ice Cold Gold. Crofton's been living and leading her own documentary life based out of here in Portland, Oregon, but has worked extensively in places like Alaska and Greenland. And lastly, I'm also looking forward to having a conversation with Robert Hardy, founder of The Filmmaker's Process, a website that really it focuses strictly on the art and process of filmmaking as an answer to all of the so-called filmmaking resources that really only focus on the acquisition of more and more gear. Robert is someone who has a lot in common with us documentary lifers, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. As a final thought or request, I want to thank you again for tuning into this show. Again, we're 10, 10 episodes deep, and we're looking to just continue this on. And I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm super excited to do it. One thing that I might ask of you that's going to help me greatly, if you can, go to your podcast app or go to iTunes, wherever you're listening from, and do me a favor. Give me a five-star review and then write a few words about the podcast. That's going to help increase our numbers. It's going to help you know bring an awareness to to the podcast what we're doing here and it's also going to give people an idea of what the show is about and why people like yourselves why you enjoy it that's all i ask thank you so much in advance i look forward to next week and i hope i've inspired and educated you guys again and can't wait to hear more from you we'll talk to you soon thank you Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.